Welcome everyone to session three, which is the opening in Europe of the FIG Commission 7 annual meeting. I'm Daniel Paez, chair of the commission, and we just started the webinar. It will take a few uh, seconds before we get all the participants. So already we have uh, 20 participants locked in. So welcome everyone. Um, uh, as a start, if you want uh, and to get familiar with the tools we have in this webinar, please use the chat room and tell us where you are connecting from. Tell us your country and if you want uh, your city and country and a little bit about yourself using the chat room. You also have the possibility to raise your hand and we welcome a very active participation. And if you would like to uh, type a question or uh, speak, just raise your hand and we will be happy to allow you to talk. Um, we have a, a, a three uh, presentations today and um, we're going to start with the opportunity to hear from our president of FIG, uh, Professor Rudolf Steiner, um, who has been a, a fantastic supporter of this annual meeting and this uh, concept of running it online. We hope in 2021 we can do it, it in um, Melbourne, Australia, where we have an invitation by Professor Abbas Rajabifar. And um, we had to cancel the one in Switzerland organized by um, uh, Daniel Stoiler. Uh, so we hope in 2021, new normality allow us all to meet in person uh, in, um, in the FIG working week in the Netherlands and then in the FIG Commission 7 annual meeting in, um, in uh, Melbourne. With any further ado, I would like to welcome Professor Rudolf and um, the floor is yours, Professor. I hope you can hear me all. Uh, my name is Rudolf Steiger. I'm the president of International Federation of Surveyors, FIG. And it's a pleasure for me to open this Europe section of the annual Commission 7 meeting. Unfortunately, we had to cancel the classical Commission 7 meeting, but due to Daniel Pear's vision of organizing a real global and multilingual Commission 7 meeting online, it's a pleasure for me to be here and we are very keen looking forward to these experiences we are making during these days. Three months ago, we thought we can organize the next working week in the Netherlands normally, but the current situation is difficult. We are preparing the next working week and the decision is already taken. The next <clears throat> General Assembly will be in pure virtual mode and the working week will be probably virtual, maybe with some possibilities to attend, but the current estimation is not very positive and not very optimistic. So we are looking more or less towards a virtual working week and therefore we are also looking to the experiences we make. Today we have a GLTN session. I would like to thank Danny Antonio from UN Habitat and GLTN for joining us and doing this here. I would like to thank Daniel Pace for organizing this virtual meeting and to have, to have the vision for this really global multi-time zone, multi-language thing. I would like to thank Daniel Steutler for the organization of the classical meeting, which needed to be canceled. Hopefully we can do it next year. We have to see if it will work. And last but not least, I would like to thank Claudia from the office for all the technical support she gave to this. I wish you participants and speakers an interesting session, a good exchange and a good day and a good seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Steiner. Uh, we appreciate very much your words. Your ongoing support has been outstanding and a vision is nothing without all the hard work that you and your team have put uh, to help Commission 7 on this. 
Welcome, uh, Professor Stig Enema, former um, president of FIG, and many people that are joining us um, from the Netherlands. Um, John Hoho from uh, FID Foundation, our current president. Welcome. Want to also um, welcome um, Klaus van der Hoek from the Netherlands and Roham from Australia join us too and so on. So welcome everyone. More people are joining at the minute, at the minute so it's great, fantastic participation. All right, one key factor of this uh, meeting is talking about the urban rural land linkage that we are working together with GLTN and FIG Commission 7. We uh, have our um, lead consultant, uh, Dr. Eugene Chikpu, and he is in an airport moving in this crazy environment and he has accommodated his time to uh, give us a presentation in this moment. So um, Eugene, are you still around? You haven't boarded your plane yet? I'm around. Fantastic. So I'm going to share the right one. OK, Eugene, the floor is yours. OK, um, I think I, first I would like to thank um, the FIG president who's present, as well as the honorary president and past president who's also present. And I would like to thank the GLTN for their input in the work. And also important is the FIG Commission 7, uh, who's put this together uh, through uh, Daniel, so thanks very much. Um, I'll be talking to you about something we've been working on for the past six, seven months, and that's urban rural land linkages. Um, the project is con concerned about the concept and a framework for action. Next slide. Now, um, the urban rural land linkage project is based on um, the strong vision the GLTN has uh, in relation to ensuring that everyone enjoys secure land rights and that no one should be left behind. And the basis for it is all is on the grounds that um, it's not only about persons because persons um, live within settlement. And also it implies that if we have to leave no one behind, it means that no special unit or any area of development or domain of development should be left behind. And as a consequence, um, there is need to ensure that uh, interdependable or in, uh, interdependent development is pursued in terms of ensuring that um, rural and urban areas, including the intermediary settlements in between them, you know, the fringes and uh, the peri-urban areas enjoy um, benefits of development. So next slide. So the, what I'm discussing right now is actually the third draft of a report. And so it might be difficult for some of you who haven't been following up um, the previous reports to adapt to it, but I will do my best to um, lay it down. Now, um, like I mentioned previously, the premise is towards achieving a development that benefits urban and rural areas or intermediary areas. And um, it is born out of the rural urban, the ideas of rural urban linkages, which the FIG has worked on uh, more, than, more, than, more than 10 years ago, actually. The FIG has worked on this. Um, the UN Habitat has done a lot on, 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 on this subject as well, and several other stakeholders have done this. But um, what the GLTN and the FIG through the cluster, um, through the uh, through the GLTN cluster is doing basically is to take the, take it a step further and emphasize um, the focus on the land perspectives of urban rural linkages. And so that's why we came up with the idea of urban rural land linkages. Next slide. Now, the objective obviously is, um, is that it should be a collaborative exercise um, at the GLTN, but is led by the FIG. Um, it represents GLTN partners' direct effort to contribute to the concepts, the principle, and frameworks for action towards interdependent development. Um, and in previous slides, I've, we've used the terminology balanced development, but um, there have been some criticism uh, over that. And so today we have intermediate interdependent development that is 
a development that benefits urban and rural areas uh, without putting either of them at any sort of disadvantage. So it is hoped that this framework will inform activities of GLTM partners. And um, so far, there are emerging issues here. The concept of urban rural land linkage itself is is not um, is not a popular concept. It emerged from this work, and the framework for action itself is in response to land issues that can simultaneously be dealt with within the urban and rural areas. Next slide. So the starting point is on why this is necessary is because um, urban and rural areas, as we found out through literature, have both opportunities, they have a lot of commonalities. There is no, it's difficult to find a particular place where that is um, completely urban and without some sort of rural character. And it's also difficult to find a rural area where that is completely rural without some, you know, urban character. And as a consequence, um, we, are looking at the commonalities that urban and rural areas have in terms of similarities rather than focusing on the differences but as well as acknowledging that there are differences upon which we can build in order to reduce disparities in development so land problems are unique and common in both special units including the intermediary units such as very urban areas um, wherever they exist and so urban and rural areas basically have more commonalities and so that justifies why we intend to um, keep working on this project. Go on. Next slide. So the gaps and justifications, uh, there is no, currently there's no specific land tool for addressing the land components of uh, rural urban linkages or urban rural linkages. So such a tool is necessary because it would be uh, people-centered and it would also lead to ensuring that no place is left behind because the only way we can cater for leaving no people behind is to ensure that no place is left behind because people live in places. So existing frameworks are also too generic. So we acknowledge that a lot of work has been done by the GLTN, by the World Bank, SAO, the UN Habitat, and several others, um, urban rural uh, linkages. But these, most of these works are too generic and lack land specific elements. And that is where this particular issue of urban rural land linkages becomes useful. And also important is that stakeholders have done several works that we are currently building on. Next slide. So I would, there are several, several issues that have emerged from here. Um, I'm, I think Daniel will share the reports later on, but like I said, those of you who haven't been following up may find it difficult to, you know, engage. So I'll basically go straight to the framework itself, but We've been able to create specific principles that are different from urban rural land, no, urban rural linkage principles that are principles that are specific on urban rural land linkages and which you will find in the document. But these principles are actually what leads to um, the current frameworks I'm going to discuss. Um, the current framework, um, and this goes to those who've been following up, is not the same, exactly the same as the previous one. And uh, what we've done so far is that Initially, we had a one-off framework, but now um, we've distributed it or kind of um, deconstructed it into three separate frameworks. The first framework is one that shows a scheme or justifies the land-based solutions to urban rural um, continuum challenges. In this perspective, the argument is that um, special socioeconomic and governance, governance and environmental issues are key problems or challenges that are encountered in both urban and rural areas. And so finding a unified way of managing and administering them, so land administration comes in here. So rather than what is usually the land administration in silos, but we talk about cross-border land administration. Um, a land administration that does not, you know, that is borderless in terms of how it considers urban and rural rural areas so whatever decision that is administrative decision that is taken within the urban would be based on a uh, would be based on facts that on how it relates to the rural areas also the same applies to investment in terms of economic transactions and um, having a land administration that is cross that provides cross-border services uh, uh, provisions and development of land markets 
This is not to say that urban and rural land markets are the same, but it just reflects that considerations should be put on the consequence of actions within urban rural land markets as they relate to um, uh, relate, relate to um, the adjacent markets around. Then of course, the infrastructure, the issue of um, special enablement or special networking, of course, is something that has been quite dealt with, but yet not, not much has been achieved in this regard. And so issues of land use planning should um, go, you know, aspire towards ensuring connectivity between urban and rural areas and mobility as well as accessibility. And so these are already things that exist, but that needs to be worked on from the perspective of land. Next. Yes, and um, the urban rural land, rural land linkages itself can be a strategy for urban rural continuum of development. And in this perspective, um, of course, we know that the um, development itself or land interventions in any way they exist do not actually exist in isolation. They actually are driven by policies, by visions, by goals. And so what we're doing here is to look at a situation where a strategy that is based on improving functions of land management and administration in urban and rural areas is put in place with the objective to innovate cross-border functions of land management and administration, um, institutionalize inclusive and fit for purpose responses to urban rural land issues by scaling up tenure security interventions um, across borders and catalyze land sector functions using cross-border land governance and land policies. And of course, um, building a knowledge which can be monitored or information which can be monitored and evaluated to ensure that land related actions and information are tracked as to their consequences, and their relationships, interactions, uh, collaborations and interdependencies in both urban and rural areas. And the action oriented issues here would be to review, prioritize, develop and implement cross border, specially inclusive and people centered land interventions to develop and share knowledge on urban, rural, relevant land related issues, and to develop capacities of key land actors, you know, and institutions and change agents in the perspective of, uh, or in the domain of urban, rural land concepts and operations. So um, if we're able to do this, the expectation is that there will be some sort of either immediate outcome, but mostly uh, we focus on the impact. So it could lead to the evolution of combined urban rural land sector activities uh, so that they can work together to develop and implement inclusive fit for purpose and gender responsive interventions. And this is uh, as the GOTN has um, preached over the years and proven in their work at country level. It's the only way to improve living conditions for all uh, places and for all people, especially to prioritize women, youth and vulnerable groups in urban and rural areas. Um, next slide. Now, from the activity, um, from the activity perspective, um, the framework itself um, involves uh, creating a vision, uh, contextualizing that vision. Of course, the vision uh, is based on GLTN um, 2018 to 2030 strategy. Um, GLTN has a lot of focus on land acts uh, of tenor security and the basis is ensuring that there's land access and land use interdependence, interdependencies between urban and rural areas at country level. And this implies respecting global, regional, national, local and grassroots urban and rural development agendas. So where such a vision exists, then the, uh, the, 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 the next would be to, con to contextualize it by innovating and institutionalizing and catalyzing and monitoring uh, land tools, uh, land sector reforms, um, capacity development issues, and other land related commitments. Um, this has been left generic because this differs from country to country. Now, the consequence is that the strategy would evolve towards um, cross border land laws, policies, and practices and um, programs that can be viewed as interlinked uh, land governance across borders. And the rural urban or urban rural outcomes would be uh, what I initially mentioned to be interdependent development, which is mutually 
um, a development that is mutually beneficial um, to urban and rural areas, and that means in terms of land-related service delivery, increased land access, spatial connectivity, tenor security, among many others. And the impact itself would be to have the specially enabled and socially networked uh, uh, beneficial development, which can um, benefit both the rural and the urban and look at um, complementarities, what the urban can give the rural and what the rural can give the urban in return. Next slide. So in terms of operationalizing uh, this, um, I think one of the key issues is having specific principles for urban rural land linkages. The reason is because um, we need to know where the difference exists between the usual urban rural linkages and urban rural land linkages. So specific principles would be needed for each oper its operationalization. Some of these principles are already in the report that will be shared later. Also, a holistic view of land challenges in, these, in urban rural areas or peri-urban areas along that continuum is important in the, you know, from developing country perspective because it is integral to finding a balance in terms of development. Um, the GLT and its partners, um, other implementers um, have several tools already available, but it's expected that um, new tools has to be in place because in, in order for it to adapt to the specific principles that, would, that is emerging from urban rural land uh, linkages. However, any tool for urban rural land linkages must have specific features that must make it effective in tackling urban rural, urban rural linkages and rural, or rural urban linkage problems. And features of such tools uh, must include broad consultation and potential land, um, land with potential land stakeholders. So, but we are yet to get there and um, we expect that stakeholders would play a specific role in this aspect as well. Next. So um, finally, um, the prospects going forward um, is that a lot of things has emerged in here. Um, the sh in the short term, potential prospects are that um, there is there will be a report for the first time on introducing the concepts and the framework for urban rural land linkages, and it's expected that this uh, it is hoped that this um, document would complement what is already existing uh, other existing documents in urban rural linkages and focus on the land context of urban rural linkage issues. So I, I consider that to be a short term issue because we, this is the third draft of the document and we hope that it will be out soon. Uh, on the medium term, potential prospects is an evolution of dedicated research fields in urban rural land linkages, but this will depend on how um, emerging issues will be embraced. And there will be emergence of dedicated professional practice in urban rural land uh, linkage, whether from the perspective of academia or from the perspective of perspective of the field and is expected that it, there will be a development of urban rural land linkage specific land to um, as soon as um, the you know we have a document that has all the information we need then on the long term potential issues is the practice of urban rural land linkage which is where um, land administration practices and land management interventions would begin to work and focus on cross-border issues without being uh, two sectoral as where um, it's, it begins or where it stops or having specific nuances for urban uh, and rural and all that, but rather put unifying them and then trying to, you know, work on the difference, on their differences uh, and then their complementarities. Um, I think I'll leave it here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eugene, for your presentation. And um, we understand Eugene at the moment is uh, moving quickly uh, between cities and might be able to join us later in the meeting. Um, how many more minutes for uh, boarding, Eugene? Do you have time to take a couple of questions? I have, I have 10 minutes. I can take questions. 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Well, it's, it's an, a great development seeing this new version. Uh, that Eugene has uh, put in place. As he's mentioned, this is the third version. 
we have had uh, two consultations, um, actually three workshops, um, uh, one internal and two with GLTN. And we have also done some cons consultations internally and um, GLTN, its uh, staff has also provided feedback. Um, so um, while I wait for questions for Eugene, I wanna use the opportunity um, to welcome our uh, rapporteur, Jean-Pierre, welcome. Uh, Jean-Pierre is from the Young Surveyor Network and it's fantastic to have his support in recording all those opinions, all these key things uh, that are happening in this meeting. Um, one, one of the key changes we're seeing in this um, new um, uh, version of the framework is this focus on having different strategies uh, for the different um, uh, uh, context, no urban, rural, and periurban. But particularly, it was very interesting to see uh, having a highlight in the periurban. Would you like to expand, Eugene, a little bit more on that um, need to have uh, a specific attention in the land sector for periurban areas? Yeah. Um, well, from our study so far, um, the, there is um, the periurban area, as we all know, has um, similarities that link both urban and rural areas. Basically, it's a linkage, um, is, a, is a linkage settlement. Um, but also, we have to uh, we have to acknowledge that periurban areas do not always exist everywhere, uh, you know. And so, when we speak about them, it, whether wherever they exist, then there is needs to ensure that um, the urban rural continuum um, has a focus around the peri-urban areas. So in terms of strategy, um, what, um, what we are looking at at the moment is um, land administration, land administration bases tend to be focused a lot in urban areas or when they are in rural areas, they are not usually um, they're not usually very active or they're not usually empowered with funding and, and you know, the activities are usually passive. And so within the continuum, uh, we're looking at interdependency would, in this context would mean that land administration activities can have more direct link in the sense that there is a connectivity in terms of information, there's a connectivity in terms of institution so that one one um, an activity or a decision that is made in the urban area or peri-urban area would have to also relate to a corresponding activity in the in the rural in terms of the reaction in terms of what the consequence of activities would be whether if it's in the rural what would the consequence would be in, you know in the urban and so the interagency collaboration is a key strategy in this context where land administrators should basically view themselves as land administrators rather than purely urban land administrators or rural uh, land administrators. And a good example where um, we are seeing something like this more is um, in Uganda. They, they seem to be um, a little more of collaboration um, at the, in, in terms of the hierarchy in Uganda, but you don't find this. Uh, I'm not saying Uganda is perfect, but it does exist in terms of its it's institutionally embedded at the moment. And that's why you can see that in a country like Uganda, customary land tenure itself um, is possible to convert customary certificates to statutory. Um, in fact, customary certificates are statutory in Uganda and can be converted to, um, you know, um, to freehold. But in many other places, it doesn't work. But why this, the reason why this is this way is because first there is, um, there is, a policy in place that recognizes that. And of course, there is um, the, the practitioners themselves are try, doing their best to put it into action. At the moment, the challenge they have in those places like Uganda is in terms of recognition uh, afterwards. But um, the, it, this is a reason why we need to take up similar strategy and it works in terms of urban um, rural land linkages. So the institution is the key, and, but the practitioners have to make it work. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Uh, Jean-Pierre? Yes. There are some view from Mansur Kabir. He has talked in the view of connectivity and uh, type 
independence of urban and rural area, uh, his con consideration is that the emerging smart city concept should be integrated in the URL as an important issue that will determine the success of implementation of smart city across the world. Our very, very interesting question, Eugene. What do you think about the uh, smart cities and integration with the framework? Okay, uh, first of all, I don't have Tim with me uh, here. So Daniel, maybe you can note that down. I think um, the smart city, it's, it's a concept that is actually, that comes pretty into what we are doing. Um, the reason is because smart city concept or smart city development has very strong, um, has very strong uh, connection to rural areas because smart cities uh, demand more energy. They demand uh, big time infrastructure. Um, they also demand, you know, uh, demand land consumption. And main, most of the, the consequence is always that people who can't live in those areas tend to move to the fringe and try to occupy uh, rural land. But at the same time, that's, um, that's the negative side of it. But, in, but with um, urban rural land linkages, we're looking at it more from the positive side. And the positive side is if there are smart cities um, then there should be smart villages as well, because uh, because you have rural towns, um, which are basically urban town, or, you know urban urban villages, and they are urban villages because they have um, the characteristics or the needs of you know they supply the rural villages with the resources you know the urban resources that they need in the rural areas, and so smart city can concept can also adapt to smart village. Um, concept as um, as a decentralization of um, of um, development into the uh, rural areas because and the reason I'm saying this and this is uh, much more um, a view that is uh, personal rather than uh, um, academically informed is because we tend to assume that rural people do not want um, you know modern development. Um, but I think um, what we've seen so far is that they want to have water, they want to have all the basic things necessary. They also want to shop in, you know, have shopping malls. But the consequence is that um, rural areas have their own, um, their own unique character. And so when you build those sort of, when you build those sort of uh, infrastructures, they should be, such infrastructures should be presented and built and design in a rural form rather than in an urban form. So, so smart city um, is good if, since we can't stop it, but it also requires smart rural areas to help um, supply it what it needs, as well as for, for the smart city itself to service the rural areas. So I, I think there is a complementarity here. Thank you. Okay, interesting. The smart village and that complementation and a very interesting concept of central assets in the village. Professor Stig Enemar, welcome. Thank you. Now, uh, just a quick question. I understand, uh, Uchin, um, you're on the road to, to Benhoek, uh, Namibia, I guess. So yes. I wish you a safe, safe journey. And, thank uh, you. And thank you for your presentation. You've got some very great slides there. Um, but just a, a very briefly, um, do you have any considerations of part of this uh, uh, new uh, THN report about how does this uh, concept of urban rural land linkages sit within the global agenda and especially the new urban agenda? Yeah. Just a few um, comments. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, actually, in the report, which I'm hoping that you get, because um, um, the report has not been externally reviewed, and I believe you, you'll be one of those who will review it. In the report, and unfortunate again, Dan, uh, Daniel may be surprised I didn't present this, but um, it's already in the agenda because the, the new urban agenda itself does talk about, um, you know, developing territorially and so and linking cities, you know, servicing cities and cities servicing uh, adjacent um, areas. And so it's in the agenda. Um, actually, in the report, you would have um, a specific diagram and section that actually explains um, how this the urban rural land linkages 
relates to existing agenda in terms of um, the voluntary guidelines, um, in terms of the most importantly is the urban rural uh, linkage guiding principles, which the uh, which the, GL, um, the UN habitats has been working on for a long time. So they already produced actually principles that kind of lay foundation for this, but not um, but those principles are usually um, not concerned with land, but much more general. So the, 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 there is a section that actually, you know, presents the gaps and why the land perspective of urban rural linkages is important for us to get into. Thank you. Yes, definitely. That was a great contribution in the report. And, and I think people will enjoy that analysis you have done on, on how the how actually there is a lot of connectivity between this um, framework and previous framework that GLTN has been has been working. Um, do you have time for another question, Eugene? One question would do. Well, okay, uh, Jean Pierre, let's give him one more question and we we'll let him go. Okay. The other question is from Adam Sa. He has asked, land value is different from urban and rural area, so the linkage is easier to adopt some urban activity in urban zone and vice versa. Yeah. Can you hear land me? Values. Yeah. Yes. Yes, Eugene. Okay. Yes. Actually, I think that's a very important question because it actually, um, I'm not going to sit here and, and say that everything is going to be fine in that regard because uh, one of the key characteristics of urban areas is the high land values because they are very functional land markets and they are much more built uh, and land is much more improved in those in those areas. And so, um, it's going to be a challenge uh, when you do cross-border um, development or at least development that considers both, uh, both areas because um, people pride themselves in terms of their land acquisition in urban areas and, and those values. But what I would say is, so this will be a challenge. Uh, I don't know how we're going to deal with that. But what I would say is that um, the idea would be that urban, rural has to remain rural. It doesn't have to be urban because... Um, and urban doesn't have to become rural per se, um, but there has to be those uh, backward and forward um, exchanges, uh, which, can, which can also help. I think a big issue would be that if you, if you develop across the border, there's a consequence that rural, rural landholders would want to begin to envy urban landholders and want high land prices, so there will be speculation in that manner. And uh, because urban rural areas, a lot of people might have access to land there, but they want to sell it and begin to commoditize it. So I would say that this is the role that I think um, the land administrators, that's where the land administrators would come in. What do we do with a land market that becomes very difficult to, um, you know, to um, calm down, to control, you know, and um, this, is, this is a difficult one. I don't know how to get into that, but this is, ideas that um, I'm still discussing and we hope that the consultation would provide us with at least a recommendation in that aspect of uh, land values. Definitely a concept very important for the framework. Thank you, Eugene. We'll let you go now so you can um, uh, catch your flight. And if we see you at the other end when you arrive in Frankfurt, it would be fantastic to answer more questions. About this last question um, that we heard about land values, we got a very interesting presentation in session one, the opening in Asia and the Pacific, and it was by um, Kate Rickesey. And I think um, we will be sharing those videos and allow people to um, uh, hear some of these ideas and how small farmers, for example, have that dilemma uh, when, when dealing in, 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 in peri-urban and, and rural areas. All right, um, we have Bye. adjusted a little bit. Bye, Eugene. Bye. Um, we have adjusted our uh, schedule a little bit to uh, allow uh, Eugene to catch his flight. Um, so now we're going to um, move to our next presentation, which is uh, from Danilo Antonio. Uh, and Danilo Antonio is part of the GLT end. And um, I'll uh, start sharing my screen 
with his uh, presentation. Danilo, if you give me one second, I will have it ready for you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Daniel, uh, and uh, good morning to all, um, uh, to the FIG president, uh, Stigene Mark. And uh, I guess uh, I see a lot of uh, common names in the uh, in the list of participants. Uh, and thank you, Eugene, for taking time during your very difficult, uh, <laughs> long, long, long journey to Windock. Uh, so we really appreciate the uh, the commitment of Eugene in presenting this uh, draft framework on urban rural land linkages. So my pre presentation will focus more on GLTN's country initiatives uh, and, and looking at how, uh, put, how, how, how these initiatives are basically strengthening the community resilience, particularly in the, uh, during the pandemic. Next slide, please. Yeah, just very briefly, uh, just introduce what is the Global Land Tool Network. It is uh, basically an inter, uh, it's a multi sector and uh, international partners network, uh, which about now composed of about 85 partners. It, uh, it, it's basically providing, uh, promoting the continuum of land rights approach in terms of providing tenure security, especially for the poor people. Uh, through inclusive, gender responsive, and fit for purpose land policies, tools, and approaches. Obviously, this is also within the framework of the international instruments, particularly the um, Sustainable Development Goals, the New Urban Agenda, uh, the Human Rights uh, Framework, and other uh, international instruments. Next, please. So, the, the focus of GLTN is really more of looking at how to secure land rights, particularly if you like in the urban context, the slum dwellers, and in the, in the rural context, the, uh, the uh, people who live in the customary areas. Uh, and of course, within, within those elements, within those areas, the issue around uh, the participation of women and uh, improving access uh, by women in terms of land and natural resources also uh, with the youth. So the, the issue is more of if 70% of the population in the world are uh, obviously non-documented, uh, so what do we do? How, how do we actually uh, make sure they have secure land rights uh, in, in a way that is uh, more, uh, more uh, feasible, faster, and if it's like uh, more uh, affordable? So that's really the, the essence of the GLT in work uh, in practical terms. Uh, next, please. So I just want to briefly look at again, the uh, present again, the continuum of land rights. It, it's not a theory for now, but it's rather a powerful concept, uh, but it's really just understanding that there are very rich land tenure diversity in many countries, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, where uh, the intention is really to formalize informal land rights. And the, uh, the, within, within this continuum, uh, the different, if you like, the different ways of providing tenure security could be different in different contexts and in different countries. So there, there is what we call in this continuum, there's lies a wide and complex spectrum of rights. So we need to really find that and contextualize all our uh, interventions and making sure that uh, we, we don't really just uh, attempt or focus in just one way of providing tenure security, which in many cases uh, is about free registered freehold. Next, please. The other aspect of, the, uh, of, of this work is around the fit for purpose land administration, uh, which has three uh, frameworks. And uh, obviously we have our own expert, uh, Stig in, the, uh, in, in our midst. Uh, this is really more of making sure that if we actually promote uh, the continuum of land rights, what could be the, uh, the strategic way of doing it? So we, we all come up with this fit for purpose uh, principle frameworks uh, to make sure that we we try to, uh, to to adopt an alternative way of providing tenure security at scale, so we are able to actually uh, you know move forward uh, from uh, from the reducing these numbers of undocumented uh, households or people 
uh, from 70% moving towards probably 50 or 40% uh, after the SDG. Next, please. So we, we, we do have more, uh, I would say, landfills, and uh, I, I will not discuss this on this, on this presentation, but uh, you're most welcome to visit the uh, GLTN website. They're all there. You can always uh, download them. And if you have any other questions on how this, being, this is being implemented or being used uh, in different countries or by different institutions, uh, please let us know. So I just want to emphasize that in the, the overarching, uh, if you like, uh, GLT and tools or uh, principles are based on the continuum of land rights approach and also the fit for purpose land administration aspects. Next, please. So on this, I just want again to, uh, to bring to the attention of, uh, uh, of our colleagues that when we GLT and uh, goes to country, uh, we, we simply have uh, the main focus is about providing tenure security again, uh, in both urban and rural poor. And uh, we are doing this in two ways. Uh, we support the national land reforms, uh, which potentially could mean uh, development of land policy or implementing uh, the land policy aspects, also developing uh, institutional uh, arrangements or improving their uh, ways of doing business on land reform, uh, including uh, development of it for purpose land administration strategy. On the community level or at the local government level, uh, we try to implement the different tools of GLTN, again, to provide tenure security. Uh, and in the middle of this work, uh, we have a lot of course cutting interventions, obviously. It's about awareness building, advocacy, uh, capacity development, both at national and also at community level and about national knowledge management. Next, please. So, here is just a snapshot of where we are now in terms of GLTN country engagement. Uh, uh, for now, we are uh, at the moment, we are like more than uh, 10 or 10 to 12 countries uh, globally that are have existing uh, interventions. Next, please. So allow me to move uh, in, in a way that uh, provide some, uh, uh, some orientation on what we're doing. Uh, in different countries, uh, and and I, I I try to bring this into uh, into different categories, and one way to do it is to uh, to provide the uh, the context where we are actually providing uh, support or providing uh, our services to the countries. For one is about formal land registration uh, system. We support the registration of the jury land rights. Uh, so probably five years ago, this is not common for GLTN work but we do now working in DRC Congo, in Namibia, in Nepal. Uh, we established a land, land information systems based on the SDDM tool. We also try to integrate under this LIS system, the business processes of the, the, uh, the agency or the ministry, uh, which may include also mapping of spatial units and obviously providing capacity development intervention. In Congo, for example, we are actually developing the LIS system of the province. Uh, we're trying to make it at least for next year up to four provinces. Uh, and in Namibia, uh, we, de where we developed the uh, cadastral database or of, uh, of the Ministry of Land Reform using uh, STDM tool, uh, where this uh, flexible land tenure uh, will be, uh, will be uh, used. So in Nepal, uh, we, uh, we transform their systems into open source uh, system uh, in, in the Laka district. So this is a survey and, and mapping uh, office. Next, please. So the next one is about improvement of informal settlements. And, and, and some of you may know in the very beginning, this is where, where, where actually we focus our energies, uh, particularly in terms of implementing uh, our, uh, our uh, social tenure domain model tool. So in informal settlements, we involve, it involves collection of household or settlement level data on land tenure, housing, basic services, and socioeconomic uh, data. So, and, uh, and, and this, this data is now being used for the, uh, by decision makers, but also by NGOs and community members to uh, promote uh, tenure security uh, and, and, uh, and also to make sure that the data is, is used as uh, the evidence uh, base data for uh, development. 
So this happening in Kenya, in Uganda, in Zambia, uh, also in, in the Philippines. Uh, in Zambia, this is, uh, is, is also very uh, promising because the law also provides uh, the insurance of what we call the uh, occupancy licenses, which is uh, given to uh, uh, settlements or to households for up to 30 years and could be actually be um, renewed up to uh, 30 years. And this could also be transformed into a freehold title. Next, please. So the next one is about recognition of customary land rights. And this is happening at least in three countries we're working with uh, in Uganda, Zambia, Laos. So it strengthens land governance systems. So it's not just about uh, looking at the land rights. Uh, it also provides a practical approaches on bridging the gap between policy intention and reality on the ground. Uh, in Zambia, for example, uh, we try to influence the land policy development on what's happening on the ground. Uh, in Laos also, they're, uh, they're, they're trying to develop uh, a new land law on the, uh, on the um, on the recognition of customary land, or they call it them uh, cooperative land or collective land. Uh, since they don't know exactly what to do, so we are actually providing them some inputs on how this is be done properly uh, uh, using also being the inclusive processes or participatory processes. Next, please. So the other side of it, uh, and this is now becoming really uh, for GLT and it's becoming more uh, expansive terms of the work is around restitution of housing, land and property rights uh, in post-conflict uh, context. So these are, we, we try to protect the HLP rights, uh, obviously for uh, different purposes, but it's also about social inclusion uh, and also uh, uh, addressing inequalities. Uh, we, the, our tool, uh, particularly SDDM and enumeration is very much, uh, uh, I would say, um, very good model to set the basis for more comprehensive land and HLP related interventions. And we could do it very fast, uh, given that in these conditions, the, there's no, I would say the, the, there's no law or there's no formalities uh, uh, set aside. So we're able to actually uh, record the claims of different uh, you know, IDPs and refugees. So in Sudan, we're doing this in Iraq, in Syria, which is, uh, I would say, a challenging project, but what we're trying to do is also document HLP rights, who are actually based in Lebanon and Iraq, but they have also uh, rights over uh, some properties uh, in Syria itself. So this is also expanding in South Sudan, uh, in Somalia, in Palestine, and uh, I, I think this is also moving uh, towards looking at the camp management, uh, where there's a lot of people are also trying to, uh, to look at their rights, uh, but also uh, in terms of providing, uh, if you like, housing or land tenure security and try to reduce the conflicts with the host communities. Next, please. So a, a lot of those uh, I mentioned is, is, is really more of, again, tenure security, but take note that when we start working on the tenure security, we start also expanding to work like governance, uh, access to natural resources, uh, improving, if you like, the relationship between government or national and local governments, and also uh, capacitating the community themselves. So as a result, as of today, we, uh, I would say there's an increased tenure security for more than 1.5 million people. Uh, this is really, uh, I would say, a very uh, estimate. Uh, in, in some cases, I would assume we, we've done more, particularly, for example, in Nepal, where we actually uh, supported the, the development of the land policy, and now they actually set up their own land commission, whose only purpose is to provide tenure security for the landless and land poor. Next, please. So... Just looking at how does this uh, COVID-19 uh, impact on our uh, work? Obviously all, uh, I mean, it's unprecedented issue, all are affected, but uh, let me say that poor, the poor women, youth and vulnerable groups are disproportionately impacted. Uh, given that they have less security of tenure, they have less influence and less, uh, if you like, uh, financial resources, 
uh, this COVID-19 actually impacted them more. And also aside from, from that, the government services and programs were put on hold and were delayed. So in poor urban and rural communities, more risk of forced evictions. There's also increase of, uh, in terms of tenure insecurity, simply because for one reason, they also lost their livelihoods. So obviously uh, that, that kind of risk uh, is also been uh, increased. Uh, under our GL10 interventions, there is always a delayed activities. Health risks, obviously, not just for uh, our project officers, but also for the community. There's also some cost implications, as you could imagine. Uh, any extension of projects will have cost implications, but also increase in terms of uh, costs. Uh, for example, uh, government restrictions on mass gathering. So we need to adapt and adjust. So we need to do is to break out some of these numbers, which means uh, increase in terms of costs and of course, in terms of time. Then we, we all know, and, and I, I'm stating uh, the fact probably in the global arena, that there could be a potential challenge on funding as, as even the first world, uh, the Europe is also affected by COVID. Next, please. Well, some good news around this is that our community-based accurate and real-time information, which was actually been drawn uh, through, through uh, our tools and with the community participation, is now being used uh, in different countries to actually have more, uh, for people to have more access and for government to actually have a direct and fast uh, provision of services and aid uh, in regards to COVID. That's already happening in Nepal, in, Can in Kenya, uh, in the Philippines, where uh, the data is actually being used for, for this purpose. So we are really happy that uh, somehow the data which is obviously also being kept and maintained by the local communities are able to provide that kind of influence in terms of COVID-19 responses. Next, please. So just emerging lessons, uh, lo looking at this, uh, but also reflecting on the COVID-19, uh, we really think the continuum of land rise framework really works. You know, uh, and, and, and if we were able to provide tenure security as fast as we could and provide some kind of recording on the people to land relationships, so we'll be able to actually use even the data for other purposes, uh, especially in, in times of pandemic. Uh, it's obvious to us that inclusive fit for purpose uh, land tools uh, really facilitate tenure security and is now being uh, is clear that is also providing other develop, uh, addressing some other development objectives. Uh, one of them obviously is identity. Uh, the other one could be, uh, you know, that kind of relationship with, uh, with local authorities, uh, which now provides them uh, more access to services, uh, especially infrastructure, health, and now uh, water, for example. The community-based information systems uh, helps accelerate COVID-19 responses, as I mentioned, uh, and this is really clear and it's happening. And, uh, and this one, the local authorities in particular are able to actually uh, recognize the, the importance of this kind of information. Building capacities of poor communities is also going beyond security. Uh, it, it actually builds sustainability and resilience uh, and, and, and that experience of uh, them doing data collection themselves doing enumeration, it builds that kind of uh, commu community coherence uh, and, and, social, and it increases social uh, capital. So again, uh, land is about people, uh, but they should be at the center of policies, projects and practices. And I think this is what's uh, what kind of uh, emerging lessons happening, uh, at least in the countries where GLTN is uh, operating. Thank you very much. Land is about people. That's very right. Thank you, Danilo. That's a fantastic presentation. And um, given us an, an overview of GLTN, I've always been a big uh, fan of GLTN. Uh, GLTN is fantastic expansion in, into new countries, very difficult areas of the world. And so congratulations of that. And, and we hope um, that effort that we started with Commission 7 to expand to Latin America 
um, continues and we can in, we can increase the presence of the GLDN as its tools um, uh, in a, across the different regions of the world. Um, remember, you can ask us questions to Danilo through the Q&A, the chat, or by raising your hand like Stig Nenemar. Stig, we would love to hear from you. Thank you, Ren. Um, Danilo, thank you for your presentation. It's, uh, it's always great to hear, and, um, and especially about uh, how you can really proceed with this, uh, this engagement. And uh, I'm very impressed, actually. Now, uh, I, I have this basic question, and it may, it's, it's not too embarrassed, but it, it is a basic question. I mean, uh, we do know that, uh, that doing all these pilot projects, we do know that this uh, pro poor land regulation, as well as, as the fit for purpose concept, does work, right? So, um, so we don't need any more uh, pilots. We actually need implementation. We need country level in implementation. So how do we how do we really move towards country uh, um, full scale implementation, and and how could how could TLTN really facilitate that that process? So including of course capacity development, so we ensure that that we don't start things that we can't sustain. So uh, how, how do we get into the implementation phase, and how can TLTN team up, if you like, with with other organizations like uh, World Bank, FAO, the, the big donors. Are, are, how do we really push this forward? Thank you. Danilo. Oh, OK, you, you want me to answer that? I mean, uh, <laughs> stick, uh, I mean, very, very good question, but very challenging. Uh, these are the kind of question we also try to uh, to think about and, and strategically uh, lo looking forward for some answers. The the issue is more one is really funding. Uh, so while we recognize that this kind of if you like uh, uh, scaling up approaches is already happening in DRC and in in, in to significant extent in uh, in in Uganda. But we're not yet reaching uh, the kind of, if you like, uh, scaling up that could, if that could really change uh, big time, uh, say in the next ten years. So, and and truth is, we're not really expecting that GLTN will have that kind of role. Uh, we, it, it's a network, and it, it's it's a United Nations agency, so it has to come uh, obviously from the government side, and that's what we can only do is to convince uh, further the government uh, to seek more funding and resources uh, and actually be exposed on what we're doing. Uh, when I say it's happening in, in Uganda, uh, just recently they are able to, to adopt STDM for them to develop uh, a digital certificates of ownership, customary ownership. What does it mean? It means that the government is now taking Taking the the work on board, and 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 it's it's countrywide implementation, so that's kind of happening. And potentially we could have another, I would say, larger program uh, next year. In, in DRC, in the context of Red Plus, uh, and of course post conflict, uh, this is also uh, more or less happening uh, in terms of funding and resources, and 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 I think GLT in, in some or UN Habitat somehow. Fortunate, uh, given that the, the there's not much players also in the field, and uh, we are trying to again trans uh, provide support on the land land reforms uh, again big time. So that's also happening. Uh, the questions around uh, you know partnering with with the big banks and uh, and of course with other uh, with other UN agencies, that, that's very very true, and 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 hopefully that's. Uh, happening very soon. Uh, of course, our uh, you you guys as partners uh, working in international arena uh, would really support us uh, towards this, towards this. Uh, but also making uh, just a side comment also that while we are introducing these uh, innovative tools on the ground, there's still very much I would say um, inertia. I mean, there's still, I would say, unspoken 
uh, reliance on the traditional technologies and uh, uh, and land administration systems. And this is where FIG could actually really, uh, I would say, focus on in terms of uh, influencing our colleagues, uh, land surveyors, valuers to really uh, uh, move to the higher road and actually uh, take take the steps to, towards a more, I would say, more elaborate and more um, people-oriented uh, interventions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Danilo. Um, we get in, uh, in some of the questions in the chat or some of the comments uh, that the desire of people that uh, GLTN keep uh, doing some uh, of their projects in more countries, in reaching more um, uh, places where it's needed, where the, t the tools are needed. But of course, as you explained it very well, this is um, this is dependent on the funding and the availability of funding for for expansion. Um, something very interesting, stick uh, in a pro in a in a book chapter that I'm writing with Greg Foliante uh, at Melbourne University for a, a coming book with um, about COVID and geospatial industry. We have found that one of the things that happened in the COVID is that we at, across the geospatial industry, we are an industry of pilots. And that's very, it's an innovation. It's an industry that innovates and moves quickly and creates a lot of um, opportunities and wants to show the clients the, the leading edge of technology at the same time means that in a, in a moment of crisis, the tech, since the technologies are not established or they are not robust enough, they cannot be deployed. And that was some of the experiences we found in COVID-19. There were a lot of um, technologies out there that we pilot, including drones, uh, photo imagery, uh, tracking devices, uh, applications and so on, but we never took it into a level of a stability like they do it in aviation or in manufacturing or um, in the health sector or even in other IT sectors like cybersecurity. So they, there's some lessons there. And I think as, as you point out, we want uh, further large implementations and we need to move into perhaps not the most advanced leading edge technology and seeking for innovation in every corner, but perhaps going back to stable, reliable, um, tools, which is a lot of what we're seeing in GLTN and, and that allow us to, to consolidate and enable a country to, to adopt them. What a great opportunity at the moment to welcome James Kavanagh from Commission 9. Uh, James is also developing a GLTN project uh, about the valuation on unregistered land. And uh, everyone welcome uh, pretty much at the same time tomorrow uh, for a session with our keynote speaker, Raftuts uh, from UN Habitat and James and others will be presenting and James will bring together this project about urban rural linkage and uh, his project at Commission 9. So a lot of cooperation and a lot of good work that we've been doing together. Um, we don't wanna have this opening to be too long. And I think this is a great opportunity to um, listen to the activities and projects that we're doing on um, Commission uh, 7. And uh, I'm going to share quickly a presentation I have prepared. Uh, and I also give you a guide of this fantastic annual meeting, which has been um, fantastic to lead. But thanks to fantastic volunteers and people that have uh, put a lot of effort, including Rohan Bennett, which is uh, joining us in these sessions and, and others that have uh, offered their time. So thank you to those of you. And um, before I share my um, presentation, I'm going to open for a poll. So with a poll, you, are, uh, we can, you can answer uh, the question and we can get a sense of the attendees, which is a fantastic attendee. We have over 50 people at the moment. Uh, in this webinar. So I'm going to activate the, uh, the lunch polling. And um, do you think you will be able to travel to the FIG Commission 7 annual meeting in Melbourne, Australia to happen in October 2021? Please use your devices to answer um, and give us a sense how you're feeling, how you see in the industry. One of, of the things that we will be working in Commission 7 is that, is try to project 
the industry and try to understand what is happening with the geospatial industry uh, throughout this pandemic and how things are changing. So do you think you're going to be joining us in Melbourne? As you know, some of you might know, Melbourne is in a um, moving away from a strict lockdown. They were in a strict lockdown that was going to be initially six weeks. It's been now 10 weeks, uh, but they hopefully they got in, they're getting good news recent good news and 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 they're moving uh, out of the uh, lockdown we hear different um, different uh, news from Europe we we hear from Rudolf uh, he he thinks there are challenges uh, ahead and um, and it's uh, it's it's in that environment of uncertainty that we're moving of course there are opportunities too and I will discuss some of those in my presentations all right we're going to give a few more seconds for you to answer it. Do you think you will be able to travel to FIG Commission 7 annual meeting in Melbourne, Australia? Thank you to the invitation of Professor Abbas Rajabifar. Actually, 2021 is the year that we are celebrating um, 20 years of uh, the creation of the Center for Spatial Data Infrastructure and Nano Administration. Uh, funded by Professor Ian Willison, former chair of this commission, and now headed by Professor Abbas Rajapifar. Um, I was um, honored to be a PhD student in that school, along with Rohan, um, Ked Rikese, who presented this morning, or um, Mohsen Kalantari, who is going to be chairing the session uh, next uh, Wednesday, tomorrow, at, at pretty much at the same time. Right, let's have a look at the results. Uh, 50, uh, 60 percent of you, 15 answers, not sure. Uncertainty, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a definitely uh, a complex um, situation. Uh, then we have 28 percent, and maybe one that definitely is not coming. And definitely two yeses, probably <laughs> Rohan and someone else that is in the area. But the way Rohan asked me uh, through the chat that um, that I was that I look like a pilot at the moment. Well, this is um, this is when you learned working from home. You learned some tricks. This is actually a low range um, um, headset mic, so actually you couldn't hear a lot of the background noises that was happening while uh, my wonderful wife was putting the kids in bed uh, just a few, few minutes ago. Right, let's um, close this poll and move into my presentation. And in this presentation, I'm gonna do two things. I'm gonna chat what I'm seeing as this disruption of the surveying profession and what are the opportunities for you all to le learn about these uh, changes and disruption, inc including COVID-19 during this annual meeting. As Rudolf Steiner said it, it is a multi-language, multi-time zone uh, annual meeting. Um, and uh, we have uh, people around the world helping us, like Jean-Pierre and others, volunteers as a repertoire and moderators. So what is disrupting, disrupting the surveying profession? quick presentation about myself. So uh, uh, as chair of the commission, I'm originally from Colombia, but I am at the moment in Australia. So in here in Australia is 8, 8, 15 p.m. I'm a civil engineer with a PhD in geomatics from Melbourne University. And I have 20 years of experience in different areas. I have worked both in the private and the public sector. And at the moment I have my own private practice as consultant. Commission seven would like to see ourselves um, uh, as um, a focus within FAG on cadastre and land management. Um, that includes cadastre surveying, land information system, new technologies, laws and regulations. And in the land management, uh, registration, land taxes, rates and municipality finances, global challenges such as poverty alleviation and climate change are also part of the commission. Sometimes we get very complex discussions. And as, as Danilo was saying, um, land is about people, and as a society, people could be very complex, and we hear very complex situations, and sometimes um, countries would like us to be more uh, involved in the discussions, but in reality, Commission 7 is like a, is the board in a chess board game. 
So we don't are the pieces, pieces that have different opinions, people that support positions and alternatives and tools, people that offer in the market and others that have different political visions. We are the board, the chessboard. So the different uh, pieces move and discuss and, and have conversations and when having um, uh, an environment in where we try to foster that conversation. Let's talk about the Commission 7 meeting, uh, the annual meeting. We already had the, our first opening for the Asia Pacific. It was terrific, fantastic presentation by Kate Rickesey, um, Mike Barry, um, which is a long term member of the commission, member of FIG Foundation, um, gave us an, uh, a view of how he sees the need to have a lot of flexibility on, on our uh, interventions. And of course, Keith Bell brought us all, all these interesting um, experiences from the projects that the World Bank are, are doing. And from Cadasta, both Eva Marie and Kes um, work uh, a fantastic presentation on Fela. Those presentations were recorded and next week we will be sharing it with you. So this week, try to attend as much as possible live and next week, see if you can um, revisit them with the videos that we'll be publishing. Second session uh, was also a very fantastic uh, turn up. Um, it was an academic session in cooperation with Commission 2. And in this session, um, uh, there was a very wealthy discussion about what to do during COVID in education of surveying. As you can imagine, there were um, extremes in where we got um, experiences from Fiji that they had a very limited lockdown and could get the students back into field work very quickly. Or Professor Demo from the University of Twente telling us how they are adjusting many of the courses, many of the work uh, on online setting and trying to get new technology, special cameras and so on to be part, active part of the lesson learning. This is our session uh, three opening where we have uh, um, Danilo, Eugene, you heard, uh, they might join us later on and our president offering us a very welcome uh, word to support to this commission. Now, tomorrow for me, this afternoon for you in Europe, we're going to have the French um, session. It's 100% in French. Uh, it's going to be moderated by Daniel Rovesh, a very well known consultant in the land sector. And we're going to have um, uh, top practitioners, including uh, Rafik Kouri, who is actually uh, joining us in the session. Welcome, Rafik. Uh, Jean Philippe Lostan from IGN FI and Claire Galpin, who is the, um, a senior land specialist with the World Bank. Tomorrow, I will uh, be supporting a session who is going to be moderated by Yvonne Moreno of the World Bank, a Spanish session with a fantastic um, uh, agenda uh, with a member of the government from Juan Daniel Oviedo in Colombia, but also Mike Mora, from the Organization of American States who has our, a whole network of uh, cadastro and registry for uh, the Latin American region. We're also gonna have Malcolm Childress, Childress who will be presenting on Prindex, which is this um, uh, indicator of following and, 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 and tracking how um, uh, land tenure is moving across the world. Uh, in this session, also, uh, Stefan Palicot from IGNFI will present us some of the practical projects they are working around the world. Um, we have a session in Mandarin, for those of you that are interested, it's tomorrow. It's a uh, 6 a.m. UTC, which is um, 2 p.m. in Beijing. So I invite you to join us in that session. It's 100% in Mandarin, and uh, it's been organized and supported very much by our Vice President Jing of, uh, of FIG. Now, our big session to be moderated by um, uh, uh, Mohsen Kalantari, a professor and um, uh, associate professor at Melbourne University with Raf Tut, Director of Global Solution Division uh, of the United Nations. Uh, he is uh, our keynote speaker and he's going to be presenting tomorrow. And we have uh, um, accompanying him in this panel, um, Korean LX, Dr. Kim Takjin, who has been a long 
supporter of this commission and is at the moment the chair of working group 7.2 of the UNGGM Asian Pacific. James Kavanaugh, who we heard already, is going to tell us about the project that they're doing in RICS and the evaluation of unregistered land. Gerda, who is the former chair of this commission, and we're looking forward to hear what's happening in Austria. Vladimir Etimov, who is from the FIO Land Tenure team and he's going to tell us this uh, the component of uh, of um, food security and agriculture on that and Chrissy Pozio which is our former president of FIG will be presented tomorrow on her topic of um, uh, um, uh, informal settlements in cities we're going to have another session about land PPPs this is in cooperation with the working party of land administration and you all welcome uh, to join us in this discussion. We're revisiting those principles that were developing almost uh, 15 years ago. And um, we're going to have a presentation by uh, Indonesia, who is actually at the moment developing a land PPP, and, and we're going to hear about that project. Rohan Bennett has organized uh, two fantastic sessions, session nine, land administration and the SDGs, which you might remember the SDGs are a key driver of all the activities we do. And session now will tackle that. And session 10 is, is, is at the edge of technology. So we'll hear here from Professor Abba Rajabifav, who is working on the digital twin, but also by Brett Jones of Esri, who is uh, the company leading most of the, the commercial developments in, in that administration. Session 11, everyone welcome. We're going to have uh, country reports, uh, and it's a tradition of our FIG Commission 7 annual meeting to hear what our country is doing in the cadastral system. So you're welcome to join us. Normally, it is, it is presented by delegates only, but we have made it open to everyone, and uh, everyone can join us in, in this um, report. We have, at the moment, Nine uh, countries confirmed, so it's a fantastic um, opportunity to hear about these countries and and what they are doing in this in the land administration systems. What a great uh, thing to see that the number of participants can keep growing. So fantastic. We're going to go very quickly. I'm going to finish in in the next uh, five minutes, so I can hear from you if there are any comments, and we can uh, put it back questions to both Eugene. Danilo and myself, but we can see long, long term trends happening and they are driven by the need to address the SDGs. And of course, as you know, many SDGs have a direct relationship to land. Um, I, someone will say every, everything, but because all activity of, of, um, of human activity occurs in other and land on water. But basically, SDGs 1, 2, 11, 5 and 15 are those that are more uh, close to land rights. From my own analysis, I see the, there are challenges in developing countries and there are challenges in developed countries with the fourth revolution, um, which is ca changing rapidly, digital special business. I do, there are parts in where they overlap. One of those is cybersecurity. Definitely, they're both focusing on SDGs and PPPs. I definitely believe automation is not just for our cars. We've seen automation happening very quickly in many processes. Recently, Australia went into um, uh, tendering in the state of Victoria, a new process for automation of, uh, of uh, adjustments of, of cadastra. And I think that will be a trend, not just uh, in the equipment for surveying, but in many of the processes that we do in land administration. One of those will be identity of those uh, involved in that transaction. And if you see, if you track how the investment that is happening at the moment in artificial intelligence and automation, it is significant. So that investment that is happening at the, at the highest level is likely to uh, filter to many aspects of the geospatial industry. I also think digital doom will become much more common in our uh, approaches for land administration. Digital twin is something we've seen uh, in many years in other areas. And if you imagine um, digital twin is something that has been done in the, uh, in the manufacturing industry for many, many years. The, the digital twin basically is having a digital copy of what's happening 
in the physical environment. Um, a car, for example, a new car will have a computer. That computer will have the temperature, the condition of the airbag, the brakes, the pressure of the tires, and so on. So that is the digital twin of a car. And I think we need digital twin of our cities. And we've seen already fantastic development by Alex, who has uh, hosted our 2019 meeting. And um, Melbourne University also doing a digital twin and the UK and so on. So they are great opportunities to have that concept of in real time visualizing data that replicates what's happening in the city. Now, I, I do think the participation of the private sector will increase in land administration. And perhaps that's a component stick of your question on how we accelerate those pilots. I think when it gets into a commercial operation, uh, um, and it's, it is complex to do it in, 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 in areas that is needed. Um, uh, it's, it's difficult. Some others would, will think it's, it's complex thinking the private sector involved in, in land tenure. We, we got some arguments in favor. And, 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 and in reality, I think there will be spaces like it happened in infrastructure, as you can imagine, in, in developing countries, very poor uh, middle income and so on. Um, public-private partnership for infrastructure, physical infrastructure is very well established. And I won't be surprised some of the development happening in, um, in the land sector. And when we asked the UNESCO, uh, UN, United Nations Economic uh, Committee for Europe country members, um, they answered to us, 24 of them, that uh, 24 countries answered that 75% of them are already using the private sector in the land administration. So I invite you to explore much this topic. We have a session eight, which is October 21, 11, 30 to 130 UTC. Um, I will be presenting these results of, of a survey we did among countries, and we will be hearing uh, from Indonesia, who is doing a PPP. What is the state of the your special industry with COVID. That's been a, a, an attention I have had for a long time. You might have received some emails from me asking you to tell me how you feel about that. But let's use this opportunity uh, in this moment um, to hear what is, how you feel is happening or how you feel COVID is affecting you. So um, I just send you a a poll so please use your devices to answer and telling me what level of disruption COVID-19 is causing in your professional activity tell me what is uh, what is it uh, first answer I got is, is is booming but tell me how is COVID-19 affecting your professional activity I will show you in my next slides what is the overall perspective of the of the of the sample that we have taken so far since we start tracking it back in June um, but very interesting to hear from you guys what is affecting it what is affecting it all right gonna give you a few more seconds for you to answer I got 20 uh, 20 answers 22 great they are growing very fast a few more seconds use your device to answer it what level of disruption COVID-19 is causing in your professional activity. All will have, some of you have significant reduction, some of them limited reduction, so new opportunities and business activity is booming. All right. Okay, I look like that is what we can capture and have a look of the result. We got um, significant reduction, 6%, limited reduction, 11%. Some new opportunities now. Uh, sorry, I'm reading total number of participants. Limited reaction, 38%. Significant reduction, 21%. Some new opportunities, 31%. And business activity is booming, is only 10%. Well, it's interesting. Uh, this, as you can see, is, is a balance between some of you have, have had a significant impact, some of you have had a great opportunities, but the majority, the change has been limited, not too large in positive of negative. It's not different to what we have found in our survey. Um, I, here's the link in my presentation for the survey. You are welcome to join, to fill it. And I hope you support us, giving us your view now and in three months and in six months when we come back 
to ask you. So who has participated in the survey so far? The majority has been in the private sector, around 50%, but we also have managed to capture from the NGO sector, um, from the academia, and from the government. So we got a good, good sample, uh, but the majority from the private sector. So what is the private sector telling us? The private sector is telling us um, uh, that most of them that answer the survey, uh, they work in the cadastro survey, of course, related to Commission 7, but I hope other that work in different areas um, tell us what, how it's happening. So the majority of the results that you're gonna see is in the cadastro survey, uh, but there's also gonna be a result from uh, just spatial analysis of GIS, pla uh, GIS platform uh, development and delivery, uh, a GIS, specialist and also um, construction. So those three are the bunch of the people that have answered so far our survey. So when asked since the start of the pandemic in February, March, 2020, your professional activity has increased, decreased and stayed the same. Look, it's actually very similar to what we just heard from you. The majority have said uh, stay the same. There were some decrease, 36%, and some increases to 21%. So it's a general sense, uh, if I ask, if I'm sure if I ask this question to a conference of the uh, oil and gas industry, um, probably we will be hearing numbers of significant affectation. And if you are in other sectors like um, production of vaccines, you will have been booming. So it looks like an industry, it's an industry that as a general sense get affected, but not at the extremes of other industries. Now, when I ask, what is your perspective for the next three months in terms of professional activity? How interesting, many of you answered, stay the same. So it seems to me that a lot of uh, the geospatial sector has managed to maintain uh, their existing conditions and, and being able to uh, continue working in, in a similar uh, possibility or a similar, a similar, a similar market. Uh, There's this still people that have been affected, uh, but the perspective is the majority thing is going to increase. 40% things is going to increase compared to 10% that thing will decrease. Uh, this is an interesting question, and I'll ask that more broadly also to this group, but when asked, when do you think, when, you, when are you expecting activity to return to the same levels prior to the pandemic? With 25% people think it's gonna be in July, 2021, so a year. Um, but no far from it at 21% uh, in two years. And in the next six months more in January, 17%. So I think, it, there are different views. Uh, the majority think nothing will happen in the very short time, three to six months. Perhaps something will happen in six months, but um, it sounds to me that uh, people that answered this survey thought we will need to prepare to a disruption for an, another year. But how do you feel today? Do you feel like um, things will solve quickly or will take longer? I just shared with you a poll Please use your device to answer. When do you think normality in your professional activity as your special expert, your special uh, professor activity in general that you have will return to the your special industry? Please answer it. If you think it's gonna be in January, 2021, March, 2021, July, 2021, 2022, or you think it's, Yes, the level of uncertainty is so, is so high that depends on other external factors that is hard to evaluate. I'm gonna give a few more seconds, use your device and answer our poll. When do you think normality, the new normality at least, when do you think you're gonna be able to go to the field, have students back to the classroom? We heard about of challenges in the classroom in, in Europe at the moment. We have challenges here in Australia also. Um, so, but when do you think things will move in a in a in a, in, a, in a in a sense of better normality? Few more seconds. People still coming up with answers. Fantastic! Thank you for being active in this in this session. Let's have a look. Well, not surprisingly, the sense to most of us, and I think I will have answered the same. Fifty-three percent 
depends on external factors. No, this is the high level of uncertainty. We heard it from our um, president. Um, they are a certainty about our activities uh, at FIG, and we we move in into cater for for opportunities with online and, and in person. Uh, we're still planning uh, for for our FIG events that are part of our identity and and trying to adjust. And hopefully, we'll get more information in, in the short time. Majority of um, of you think that there will be on external factors, significant uh, uncertainty. Um, a little bit different to what we, we got from our, our, our um, survey, people gave us a little bit more or of a sense of, of one year framework. Um, I'm gonna open now for questions and, and people are welcome to raise their hand if they would like to talk. So please raise your hand if you are willing to talk. Uh, and I wanna ask you main challenges during COVID-19. I mean, it's fantastic. We heard from Danilo, very many of the things I have found in the survey were found by Danilo and his project. Fieldwork is difficult, borders are complex, low decision-making processes, countries are hesitant to make decisions, and the investment is declining, probably uh, related to economic recession. And of course, donors will be affected and probably um, their willingness to invest in, in land tenure security might, might be reduced. And virtual communication is difficult. I mean, we appreciate very much technology and it's given us this fantastic opportunity uh, I will, of course, I will always prefer to have this conversation with you in person. I will do it in our Commission 7 meetings. Challenges. Who would like to give us your opinions? What are the main challenges that are happening to our uh, surveyors around the world? Uh, feel free to raise your hand if you want to chat uh, or have a conversation or speak or send us your comments on the chat. What are those challenges? What are the things that are affecting them? This is a good moment to send it just come in and your uh, questions about challenges. Well, what people are thinking about the challenges, um, I tell you about the opportunities. And this is again from the survey that we have conducted, trying to do a, a survey every three months. Um, this is result from the latest uh, interaction of the survey. Thank you again for those of you that participated and um, opportunities seems to, to people that are around modernization of systems and and uh, and the, the people will need to um, you know spatial data has been used for preparedness and response of the pandemic and is likely to be strengthened in that role in, in, uh, and continues to be strengthened. Some of you mentioned that home office is an opportunity and there's going to be new use new uses to office space and um, um, databases probably need to be updated and that will be needed just special experts. And, um, and a good thing in more news agencies, in more governments, there are these fantastic, most of them developed by ESRI, um, uh, dashboards, and they always contain maps. So it's great for, for the industry. Uh, Krit Lemon, write us a question. Back to normality, did you discover innovations or new in initiatives or activities as a consequence of the pandemic? Challenges are in innovations for the developing world. Is your focus too much to the developed world? Yeah, interesting. Yes, I, I agree with you. There are a lot of opportunities, especially when they have to stand, stand up by themselves uh, very much. Um, but they're going to be perhaps... Uh, donors, traditional donors, a transfer of knowledge between developed and developing countries will be um, will be reduced. Um, Rohan, would you like to give it a go to this question? Thanks, uh, thanks, Daniel, and and thanks to uh, all the presenters we we had in in the session. I think. Again, like the two sessions I've attended so far, we, we've had a real mix of, of contexts and a real mix of perspectives from, from different sectors and different actors in our field. Um, I, I was also pondering something similar to uh, Crit's question, question there from the Netherlands, uh, where he's, I think he's being a bit provocative there, asking us, um, 
um, is there too much focus on on the developed world? I, I was almost um, thinking so far in what I've seen, it's the, the focus has largely been in our session so far about the developed, so-called developing world and um, um, a lot of the, the cases and the, the studies that we've, we've looked at were focused on that and, and, and rightly so when we always talk about the statistic of, of the 70 percent, um, the 70 percent who are in some way missing or lacking registration or recognition of their land rights and we heard that again raised this morning as the so-called zombie statistics that, uh, that doesn't have a sound uh, evidence base behind it. Um, and that was brought forward by Keith Bell this morning. And, um, you know, and there's probably a good argument to, to say that these kind of zombie statistics are unhelpful. On the other hand, we might say, well, we obviously know there is, there is an issue with tenure security in many country contexts, and it does impede development and not just, you know, development uh, in terms of uh, tenure security and economic development, but all, all different kinds of development, be it socially or um, environmentally. And protection of resources. So, um, a few a couple of years ago, we talked about the uh, so-called cadastral divide, and your your uh, statistics, Daniel, really raised a, a very very interesting point. Um, we can see that the impact, whilst we might initially think the impact would be severe and negative, we can see there's quite a spread in terms of. Um, what the impact has been and, and in many cases at least I think it was around a third you presented there have actually shown shown an increase now uh, that got me and I don't know if you've you've dug deeper on this and so maybe I'll throw the question to you um, but does that suggest that in those countries where COVID-19 has been less less of an impact and and I know the case numbers are still rising and there's still the, the, the story is, is still to be told what what is going to happen globally uh, but it, you know, it, so far it has been um, a, bi a bigger impact um, in in in, diff in certain places and not not others. Could we say that those where uh, the impacts were initially very big, say in the U.S. and in in uh, in northern European countries over the la end of last winter, was the fact that they were already highly digitalized, and I'm talking specifically on their land administration, geospatial areas that they're already sort of digitally transform if you will um, already had most of the data digital and most of the transactions I think in the Netherlands cadaster for example 99.94 and my, one of my colleagues will correct me uh, percent of all transactions are done online uh, with very little face-to-face -face interaction and I, I believe uh, that in the Netherlands like the land market which is underpinned by the work of cadaster has um, you know had one of its strongest years on record um, meanwhile, if I've talked to friends and colleagues, say, for example, in, in Ethiopia, um, there's far less controls, far less restrictions um, and, and, and business and life um, is, 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 um, is not completely normal, but perhaps far less disrupted. And in that context, we find that there is less, um, less digital data. I mean, they're still working on, on completing their cadastres, particularly in urban regions and those peri-urban spaces, which feeds into um, what Eugene opened the session with. So, um, is, is are we a lucky industry? Are we, is it, can we say that in this year? Are we a lucky industry in that, um, that those countries that were highly impacted are already digital and those that uh, could have been impacted more um, uh, because they weren't so digitalized or digitally transformer in the process of doing it um, have been protected somewhat because the virus impact has been less. So I'll, I'll throw that to you. Maybe you have some more depth behind your your studies that that, sh that could answer that. Yeah, well, it's a very interesting question, uh, Rohan. And uh, I think, I mean, I do. I'm not sure if we're a lucky industry. Definitely, we're not an unlucky, which is one of those that has been severely impacted. Um, uh, or, or, or severely beneficiary of, 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 of an opportunity with the pandemic, which are very few of those. Mm, I've, when I wrote back in, 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 in May an article, and I'm, I'm, I share it with you guys, um, the link in my ne next slide, I thought it was important to have a strategy. And, and one of those things is that our clients will be uh, affected, no? Um, but the recession hasn't been felt as strongly as we thought, particularly because uh, governments and central banks have thrown the book at, at, at the situation with a lot of cash. 
when I look to answer your question, and this is just to give you a perspective, I think um, we are a, a, an industry that has been ban uh, beneficiary of the uh, aid by the central banks that maintain uh, general activity, and we were not directly affected. Mm. When I dig in the surveys, most of those that surprisingly that mentioned that the activity has increased were in the um, government sector, Rohan. So it seems to me that your special experts in government are more busy. They're asking more request, uh, requests to their data, to the data sets and so on. And I'm not surprised because if, if you think about all the information they're reporting, how many cases, smart lockdowns, they need how many people live here, how many of those things, they have a special component and it's helped. In the private sector, in the construction, we saw in the in the survey some some reduction. But I will be interested to to see the new interaction of the survey. Now that you mentioned, for example, the 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 in the Netherlands there was not a significant impact on on the property market. In Australia, as you know well, there hasn't been a decrease in prices, but definitely the volumes has been affected extraordinarily. So the the, the operators of the land PPPs here are suffering because it depends on the fees. And the, at the moment, the volumes of transaction is, a, is around a fourth of, of the, the, where, the where uh, pre-pandemic people are, are, are doing less property transactions. All right. Um, the, we are coming to the end of this session. Uh, which is, uh, 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 it's been fantastic to have Danilo. I don't know, Danilo, would you like to have some closing remarks, some comments before we close? And of course, we're opening to hear from you. It's, a, it's been a, a very uh, supportive session with over 50 participants, so it's great. Danilo, any closing comments would you like to have? No? Yes? Maybe not? Sorry. sorry. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, I guess my last comment would be really just to thank uh, FIG uh, for continuing uh, the the work and the journey, given the context that we the global uh, the, the global context now with COVID nineteen. So it's really a pleasure uh, to to hear and be be part of this engagement with the FIG Commission Seven. And uh, I guess I, I look forward for the uh, other sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Danilo. Um, I had a great comment by Maurice, uh, who, if, if I remember well, Maurice is uh, Maurice is in uh, Switzerland, and. Um, he mentioned that the access to the clients, the physical content has reduced the work of surveyors, at least in, 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 in that part of, uh, of the world. Uh, I don't know, uh, Maurice, would you like to span on your comment? If you want to chat uh, or to speak at the moment, uh, but it's an interesting point, no? If you're uh, in doing work with the, the land cadastre surveyors, it's, it's, it's difficult to, um, to, to, to do. Maurice? Yes, can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Okay, perfect. So thank you. First of all, thank you very much for this very nice meeting and interesting topic uh, we could discuss. I, I will be very brief. Uh, yes, I'm based in Switzerland and uh, my profession here in my country, uh, the, the, the liberal surveyors, they are a private public officer if you want, if officer if you want. It's a very strange situation, but in fact we we have to uh, we have to to make some uh, legal acts, and for that it's very important. If it's necessary, mandatory to 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 uh, to meet uh, the the owners or the landowners, and uh, this is this was a difficult situation for us uh, during this period because sometimes, uh, especially with a collectivity like um, uh, municipalities or things like that it was not possible to meet the people and even with the private people it was also difficult so and uh, legally it's not possible to make it uh, for example by teleconferencing uh, you know a signature is a signature and this is a, a problem with our profession the notaries they have the same problem and uh, i think uh, it's a, a little bit the opposite i i, I, I highlighted also the challenge uh, the opportunity sorry ha the, having more uh, virtual digital uh, activities in our profession and this could be an activity for the Commission 7 in the future, 
in order to have uh, an harmony uh, between these two aspects. Thank you, Maurice. Definitely, that that could help us and, and optimize resources and so on. Fantastic. We we working on that, and this is an experiment, and it's it's been fantastic. The support of you guys by attending these meetings. Mm, John Hoho from the FIG Foundation. Um, actually, in a in a casual conversation we had the other day, he mentioned actually that at the beginning the surveyors in the U.S. were having limited work, but they are doing more work. I know it's super early in the morning. I don't know if John uh, is still, uh, um, is still um, uh, with us. I can see him in the list of participants, but if you are with us, John, and you would like to speak, tell us a little bit that experience that you told me about the, 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 the changes in the US in, 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 in during the profession and the market. Um, well, um, we have that. Let's hear from Stick. Stick in the mic. We hear you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, just um, a few comments on your on your great surveys. I think it's important to talk about this impact of the COVID nineteen. Um, my impression is that the, the 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 profession, in terms of the professional surveying companies and private sector and so on, is not really not really affected, not to the countries I, I, I know about. Um, it's, um, it's rather like uh, improving a bit, actually. So, but, but academia is, uh, is struggling. Um, a lot of constraints in terms of keeping uh, the programs going at, at the university and uh, changing everything to digital format. And I think we will have a reaction to this uh, from the students uh, if this goes on and on. So, um, so there's a big issue there. Um, on the more personal side, I can see the um, the whole issue of, uh, of professional activities more globally, like uh, at institutional level, like say say FIG and and all this uh, conference meeting, all these uh, activities are, are just you know just disappeared, and um, and I think that's a, that's a big constraint for the uh, for the profession as such, and and also. Uh, consultancy work generally, especially in developing countries, but, but more generally, consultancy work is just closed down because you completely. can't. And, um, completely. And um, I agree with you. I, I feel a little bit like um, a migratory bird in a cage. <laughs> so it's, uh, <laughs> it's, quite, well, it's quite fun. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Well, as you mentioned, the academic sector in many countries has been affected, but here in Australia has been particularly affected. Do we have, do I have any other comments or if not, I will thank you all um, and I'll, yes, John. Daniel. Oh my God, yeah, you're yes, still awake uh, and with us. Yeah. Please. Yes, yes, I am. Well, it's a good thing I'm young, right? What can I say? Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> of, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Commission 7 for donating the registration fee collected from the annual meeting to the FIG Foundation. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you for uh, expressing your gratitude and for us. Uh, it's fantastic to be able to support the, the Foundation. John? Yes, sir. Um, did you did you have a question for me? Um, yes, about... I, I tell me in a in a casual conversation you mentioned that the um, uh, surveying in America they, they they had a decrease in their work, but they now has stabilized. What is the situation at the moment? Tell us a little bit. It's uh, it's it's varied. It depends on the region, but. But I'd say overall, um, sur surveyor is doing very well throughout the country. Um, it's um, it's it's there's there's a lot of construction going on, and um, one of the interesting things that's been happening is um, there's a big demand for housing, for homes, for houses, um, simply because uh, you know people want to move into their own house because if they're say renting an apartment. Um, this way, by 
having their own ownership in the house, you know, they have much more area to uh, uh, occupy. And so, uh, so that's been um, driving things quite a bit. So yes, I think, I think the, the surveying profession overall is, is uh, doing okay in America. You're, you're mute, uh, uh, Daniel. Thank you, Rafik. I was just going to say, stay with me a little bit more. I'm going to play now a video of the um, uh, we prepared with John about the foundation and tell you a little bit more of the work that we're doing. Uh, if I don't have any more comments, thank you, everyone. Thank you to our rapporteur. Uh, uh, and um, uh, stay tuned and hope to see you in another session. Juan Yi, bienvenue, bienvenidos. Welcome to the 2020 FIG Commission 7 Annual Meeting. I'm Daniel Paez, the Chair of the Commission. FIG Commission 7, Cadastre and Land Management, is a group of volunteers of the International Federation of Surveyors dedicated to promote solutions and discuss ideas to better land tenure and land administration systems around the world. This year, unfortunately, we had to cancel our FAG in-person Commission 7 meeting, which was going to be held in Switzerland. Of course, we know this is not the same as our traditional Commission 7 event, which is full of friendship. But we hope this event will allow us to continue our network and hopefully with the new normality in 2021, we will be meeting in Melbourne, Australia. Commission 7 has done many interesting work. It's in this commission where concepts like fit for purpose or crowdsourcing for tenure security were developed. And today we're working in very interesting projects like um, GLTN framework for urban rural land linkage to try to integrate better development in both rural and urban areas. And with the United Nations Commission for Economic Development in Europe. And their working party for land administration in where we are developing new principles on a revised version of their principles for involving the private sector in uh, land administration services and infrastructure. Let me use the opportunity to thank those of you that pay a fee or made a donation to this annual meeting. All profits of the donation of the uh, FIG Commission 7 online event will be donated to the FIG Foundation. In this, let me now let you uh, hear from the president of the foundation what is the great work of this non-for-profit organization. Well, thank you very much for allowing me to participate in this year's Commission 7 annual meeting. My name is John Hohal. I'm president of the FIG Foundation. And I'd like to make a really big thank you for the generous donation by Commission 7 of the registration fee received for this meeting and given to the FIG Foundation. It is very much appreciated and very much needed. We will put it to good use. Thank you again. What is the FIG Foundation? The Foundation is an independent body under the International Federation of Surveyors, FIG. The foundation was established for the purpose of raising funds to finance surveying education, education and development projects, and supporting young surveyors with the prime focus in developing countries and countries in transition in order to build a sustainable future. The foundation is administered by the FIG office in Copenhagen and directed by a board of directors appointed by the FIG council. Here are the current FIG Foundation Board of Directors. 
two of the directors shown, Michael Berry and David Mitchell, are presenters in this meeting. Where did the donations go? To date, since its establishment in 2002, the FIG Foundation has donated a total of 165 grants to surveyors from 70 countries, which includes sponsoring 69 educational courses, meetings, and conferences. The foundation also aims to sponsor three to five young surveyors to the yearly FIG Working Week Congress, all from different continents. In total, 340,000 euros has been spent on grants in this period and distributed around the world. This shows the map showing the countries where the grantees have been that have received grants from the foundation, as well as on the right side, it shows a high breakdown of the percentages in the different continents, continental regions. As an example, Africa has received 32%, Europe 32% and so on. This shows a listing of the 70 countries that have grantees that have received donations. FIG has several key grant programs um, and we hold these uh, annually. They are the FIG Foundation Academic Research Grant, the FIG Foundation PhD Scholarship, the FIG Commission Publication Author Support Grant, the Aubrey Barker FIG Foundation Course Development Grant, and the FIG Foundation Grant for Young Surveyors Educational and Training Activities. More information on all these grants and other programs that we offer are available on the FIG Foundation website. The address is at the end of my presentation. We also uh, cooperate with other funded activities such as FIG Commission Annual Meetings, International Training Summer School, Young Surveyors Meetings, the Volunteer Community Surveyor Program, which is an initiative of the UN and the Young Surveyors Network, and of course, the GLTN, the Global Land Tool Network, the Social Tenure Domain Model, STDM, and the Trainer of Trainers, and this is also a program that involves the Young Surveyors Network very much. The FIG Foundation in this year's Commission 7 Annual Meeting, uh, I just decided to list um, some relationships. As an example, uh, you can see some of the people that are participating in this year's annual meeting and their current relationship with the foundation. As an example, Mike Berry is a presenter and a current FIG Foundation Board Director. Chetna Ben from Fiji is a presenter and a past FIG grant recipient. Paula Dykstra, a presenter and past FIG grant recipient. Jean Pierre is a rapporteur and a past FIG grant recipient. David Mitchell, also a presenter and a current FIG Foundation Director. And Daniel Paez, the presenter, past FIG grant recipient and the current chair of uh, Commission 7. Also Chrissy Poitso, uh, uh, honorary FIG president, past president of FIG, also a president, presenter and a past FIG foundation board director. And Ava Maria Unger, a presenter and also a past FIG grant recipient. 15 years ago, I was very honored uh, to be able to host the uh, Commission 7 Annual Meeting, the 2005 Annual Meeting in, in Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, this is kind of a, a way back photo uh, showing the attendees at, at that meeting. In the middle is Paul Vandermolen, who was chair of Commission 7. And next to him is uh, Stig Enemark, uh, who is also a past president of FIG. And uh, so it's a nice uh, look back from 15 years ago. I wish you all a very successful annual meeting and thank you very much. Uh, for more information about the FIG Foundation, please visit our newly updated website, which is fig.net slash FIG Foundation. It has lots and lots of uh, very valuable information and I wish you all the best.